This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ramika Vincent Leary and welcome to this edition of In Studio. Dr. Martin Luther King had a resonating message of love conquers all. However, in a 21st century society, the reality is we still have a long way to go. During this special edition of In Studio, We'll take a journey, one that encompasses abolitionism in Pensacola, Florida, local sit-ins, the historic Booker T. Washington High School, and much more. So get ready for a show packed with educational elements, including a few surprises. Welcome back, everyone. Throughout the program, we'll be airing excerpts from Our Voices Are Many, the Sons of Africa. We'd like to thank Mamie Webb Hickson, the creator and director, for allowing us to share this exciting footage. Switching gears, I'm honored to introduce my first guest, Dean DeBolt, an archivist with the University of West Florida. Now, during this segment, we'll be exploring abolitionism in Pensacola, Florida. It's such an honor to have you well, on the thank show, you. Dean. I'm glad to be here. All right, Dean, abolitionism in Pensacola, Florida. Please share the significance of that with our viewers. Well, Pensacola, of course, was a very strong slave area, and many of the Pensacolians in the 1840s and 50s made their income off of, off of slavery, renting the slave to the Navy and to the Army and so forth. Um, and we had a man come to Pensacola. He actually, his family actually lived here from about 1837 to 1842. And then he was from Massachusetts, and he moved back to Massachusetts, but he came back. He was a shipwright. Jonathan Walker, right? Right. Jonathan Walker, and he lived in Berkeley State in Mobile, and then came over here in about 1843. And we might not hear anything no. more about him at all after that, except in, uh, in June of 1844, uh, he was discovered off the coast of, of Florida in a boat with seven escaped slaves from Pensacola. And uh, the rule of thumb, law in those days were that you would return to where okay. they came from, which was Pensacola, Florida. And were they heading to the Bahamas? No, they were actually oh. heading northward. They were. They were trying okay. to work their way up the coast. They had sailed along the coast uh, coastline. They had left Santa Rosa Island, sailed along the coast, kind of were working their way around Florida and up the other side, up the uh, east coast. Uh, and uh, they were found, and he was brought back here. And... Uh, He's lucky he wasn't lynched right away because people were very furious about that he had tried to escape with slave. He uh, was brought back to Pensacola. He was put in prison. And unfortunately, in those days, you didn't have court sessions all the time. You had a court session every six months. Right. So from his imprisonment in July, he had to stay in jail until November court came along. And at that court, he was tried on four counts I don't know why they didn't do all seven slaves at one, but they four counts of slave stealing. He was found guilty. And the jury ordered that his hand be branded with a double S for slave stealer. Well, let's pause for just a moment now. The reward for Jonathan Walker was quite high during that time, $1,700. $1,700. Slaves made good money for their owners. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a, I mean, the, the fact that he had escaped the slave was discovered almost immediately, within days, and so they ran poster, uh, posters of it. But he branded his hand with SS for slave dealer, and later he'd become in, known in the North, that, that became known as Slave Savior. Slave Savior. Slave Savior. Well, we know that he wrote a book about his experiences here right. in the Pensacola area. A little excerpt for that basically talked about how he was pelted with eggs before the branding. They, they gave him three sentences at the court. First, he was to be branded. Secondly, he would be put to would be put in the pillory for an hour. And then the third one was he'd spend 15 days in jail. Of course, the irony was, he'd, by then, he'd been like four months right. in jail. And uh, so he was put in the pillory. And yes, he was pelted with eggs and, and that kind of thing. It was the branding that was probably the most heinous crime because no one had ever done that before. Um, and uh, so he was branded, and then he, uh, he remained in jail because even though he completed that sentence, 
the three remaining enclaves, yes. their owner came forward and filed charges for helping them. And the court didn't meet again until May. And so he spent another six months in jail here waiting for that sentence. And that sentence, they only charged him $5 each for, for the thing. So a total fine, oh, I'm sorry. In the first case, he was fined $150. Okay. Um, and so his total fine were $165. But his jail cost, in those days, you had to pay for your own right. imprisonment. And his jail cost came, the whole thing came to about $600. And he wrote letters home, and the people in Massachusetts and other places were just enraged. I'm sure they were. William Lloyd Garrison published the Liberator newspaper, and they were just totally in, uh, enraged. And so they began trying to raise money. And he was freed because a lot of the northern people were able to provide money to enable to him. him to escape. So on his way back, he failed out of Pensacola, and on his way back to New York City, he began writing his memoir. And so he published this book in 1845 called right. The Trial and Imprisonment of Jonathan Walker. Well, one thing I'd like to add regarding the book, and he mentioned the branding process. He said he would have been willing to hold his hand steady on his own, but they had it bound. They tied it. They tied it to the thing. And Ebenezer Doerr was the federal marshal, and he held the brand against his hand for about 20 seconds. He said it was one of the most harrowing experiences it had never been done life. before, and I, I still, we still don't know why, why the crew did that. But the irony of all, this, this, this negative act turned into a very positive act, because once he got home and published this book, he became well known, and he went on the abolitionist circus and showed off his hand to hundreds of organizations. Uh, Frederick Douglass right. called it an atrocity, but it was the atrocity that ignited the North and raised their their uh, action toward justice and, and for abolitionism and get rid of slavery. Exactly. Uh, John Greenleaf Whittier was then America's most favorite poet, and he wrote a poem about him called The Branded Hand. And I actually heard that it was also put to music. And so there were a couple Wonderful. of occasions where at the anti-slavery rally, he would show his hand and they would actually sing the song Branded Hand. Well, one thing I'd also heard, Dean, is that Jonathan Walker sold a lot of tracts, anti-slavery tracts, to raise money for the movement, and that he also wrote two additional books. He wrote other books as well about his experiences. Uh, sometimes on the lecture circuit, he appeared with two other slaves that had also had, had escaped from the South. And so he was widely known throughout the North, though we don't know him much in Pensacola no. anymore. Um, and uh, the jail he was at was at the corner of, of Intendencia and Alcanese. It's right across from a place called the Kena House. And the interesting thing about that is that the, one of Kena's daughters was the jailer's wife, and he wrote in his book when she was pregnant and gave birth to a child. And that Kena House is still there, built in yes. 1810. That house is still there. But the Calabozo that we call the Spanish jail is no longer there. Um, but in late in life, um, Jonathan Walker moved to first to Wisconsin, and then he ended up in, in Michigan. Michigan. And he That's buried right. in Muskegon, Michigan, and they erected a monument over his over his grave, That's it's right. an obelisk, an obelisk with it with the branded hand on it. What is most amazing, I think, about this, or an irony of this, is that in America, the first photography came in the 18, late 1840s, mid 1840s. And so one of the first things that happened was this firm in Boston took a photograph of his hand. Okay. And so we have that photograph. And it's probably the first picture ever taken in America of a part of the human body. I mean, it was so important to capture that image. Absolutely. The only person that we know right. of that has received what that What was wonderful branch. about him was that he was well known. And when he, when he died, when he passed away in 1878, Frederick Douglass, uh, said that he should he should be remembered. He should be remembered along with John Brown, Eliza I, I Lovejoy, Abraham Lincoln, yes. and others. Um, and he was just a Pensacola's shining example of abolitionism in the North. Were there any other local Pensacolians that may have assisted him? We know about him, but was there anyone else? 
he didn't admit to any. There's some hints in his in his letters. Uh, some of his letters Homer read kind of funny, and today we look at him, we say, well, the jailers were reading all of okay. his letters, so he couldn't <laughs> he couldn't really communicate everything that was going on. Um, he uh, he spent 301 days in jail, even though he was only assigned given a jail term of 15 days. He spent 301 days in jail, and 173 of those he was bound in chains. And most of that was solitary confinement. So it was really terrible punishment for him. But he turned it into a positive He sure thing. did. He turned that around. Now, did the abolitionists pay for all of his expenses that he incurred when they he was in jail? They sent him, in the end, they, they managed, they had a lot of rallies. The, the uh, Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society would have meetings. They would take up, collect, they urged clergymen and churches to take up collection for him. Um, they gave him, he managed to get, they managed to get him about $900, about 600 of that paid all his, his fines and his jail costs. And the remaining money he used to buy his ship passage for out of Pensacola okay. when he left here. Now, let's talk about our younger viewers and people that may not have known about Jonathan Walker Wright. What would you do to encourage people to find out more about these historic events? What should they do? Um, there's a lot of Pensacola history books that they should read that do mention these, and they need to take a look at them. Um, there's a lot of them with stories in them about famous Pensacolians, John Sunday, for example, and, and others that have contributed to the black history of Pensacola, and it's a very important part of our history. And how has this impacted you personally? I, uh, well, as an archivist, I go out and I try to save and collect these things. So one of the, I guess one of the fun things as an archivist is kind of making some of these things known and encouraging people to save their history. All right, Dean DeBolt, it has been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, very thank you for much. being on the program. Now, there are so many timely messages in Negro spirituals as we had to break. Enjoy the inspirational sounds of Reverend Dr. Herb Corbin. From our voices are many the sons of Africa as he sings, I want Jesus to walk with me. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Our mission is to provide girls and young women an opportunity for a better future through education, counseling, training, and advocacy to enable them to become independent, empowered young women and productive members of our society. I didn't want to graduate. I was going to drop out, and then I came to Pace. Frequent discipline problems, uh, family issues that cost them to not be able to attend school regularly, so they had big gaps in their learning. I didn't used to like coming to school, but once I started coming to Pace, it really brought me out to love school. A lot of times we might be that student's confidence until she begins to see her successes and see that she really can accomplish everything that she's come here to do. But education is more than just the academics. It's being able to function in society and be successful there. And we see that with our girls and we love it. Now I'm being a leader instead of a follower. And I have people looking up to me to be the best person I can be. Pay Center for Girls is just a beautiful place to be because amazing things happen in the lives of the girls every day and we're here to celebrate it. 
Pace Center for Girls in Pensacola, a positive environment to help young women grow, achieve, and succeed. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. During the Civil Rights Movement, many courageous young people volunteered to promote positive change. My next two guests participated in sit-ins right here in Pensacola, Florida. It's an honor to have Cheryl Allen and Della Redman on the show. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Both of you are a wealth of knowledge. Cheryl, let's start with you. The sit-ins. Now, there are some people viewing this show that may not have realized that we actually had a sit-ins movement right here in Pensacola, Florida. So give us a little bit of an overview. Well, what happened is that during the sit-ins part, we did not get much recognition for as a uh, media, media representation. representation because they didn't want us to get that exposure. So that was something that uh, we had, we didn't have much of. That's why you, didn't, you couldn't find anything. Any archival uh, pictures uh, during that time? Anything about us. But we were the ones that started the movement here in Pensacola. Della, sit in. Let's just educate our viewers even more so. What was a sit in? Well, the youth group of the NACP who was, uh, advised uh, by Reverend Dobbins gathered uh, together and he wanted us to go and sit in at the lunch counters because uh, blacks were not allowed to eat at the lunch counters. We could shop there, but we couldn't eat there. But Reverend Dobbins wanted to change that. He said, if we could spend our money there, we should be able to eat there. So Della, mm -hmm. if you wanted to eat there, did you have to go to the back of the restaurant, maybe a back mm -hmm. door? There was a side door at one of the stores. We could go to the end of the end of the counter and order, but we couldn't sit. Cheryl, how many lunch counters in the Pensacola area were affected? All four. It was four of them downtown. Can you Woolworth, tell us? Crestus, Newberries, and the other one was uh, I can't remember. So we, so we have the three, and thanks to Dean DeBolt for providing a lot of the pictures of the sit-ins that we'll see during this segment. We have a generic picture up right now, just USA, of a sit-in. But understandably so, and that's a marker from Woolworth that we have up right now. So as a participant mm -hmm. in the sit-ins, Della, what kind of treatment did you receive when you sat down at the counter? It was terrible. I had no idea that adults would treat children the way that they did. But uh, been from a large family, my mother and father talked to us about what was going on. So we knew that we weren't wanted there because of the color of our skin. And uh, we were determined to really participate. So we would sit there with our hands on the counter and people would walk by and call us the N-word, ape, monkey, mm. go back to Africa, and all of those things years ago. We even had them to burn the kids with cigarettes. These were all whites. would burn the kids with cigarettes, uh, spit on you, and just intimidate you. They wanted you, right, they wanted you to get angry and cause a problem, but we were trained not to do not that. Not to do that, love. Yes. Definitely conquers exactly. all. Cheryl, back to you. So you all were younger during that time. So let's talk about the ages that both of you were when you participated in the sit-ins. Well, I was 14 when I participated. And now, Della had gone uh, on because she was in the older group. And it was three groups of us. And there was a second group. And then I was in the third group because, see, I was younger. And those, those had gone on, they had gone on. So they were the ones that um, we, we Started came the ball after. rolling. See, we didn't get it as hard as Della did. As Della did. No. They, they, that first and second group was the group that really, went, some of them went to jail. 
Some of them uh, had to uh, had to endure things, and and some of them had things put in their pockets to say that they had stole those things. And in actuality, they had not done. They had not no, done anything. anything. The police would take items off of the counter and put them in the boys pocket. They wouldn't do that to the girls, they did it to the boys. And then they would arrest them for shoplifting. Now Della, mm -hmm. to become a sit-in participant, were you a member of the NAACP Youth Council initially? Yes. Okay, so talk a little bit about that. Well, I became a member of the uh, youth group in 58, the latter part of 58. Reverend Dobbins came in 59. Uh, Mr. Raymond Harvey, was the advisor at the time. And he worked for one of the black pharmacies here, Jones Pharmacy. And uh, it interfered with his schedule by working so much with the, the NACP youth group. So he turned it over to Reverend Dobbins. So let's talk mm -hmm. about Reverend <coughs> Dobbins in particular. Mm -hmm. He's done so much yes. in the community yes. and beyond. So Cheryl, let's provide an overview of who he is and what he did for the sit-ins and of course what he's doing today? Well, Reverend Dobbins was a very young man, 23, and I think Martin Luther King was 20, 20 something. Mm -hmm. But he was a real short man, but had, but was Lots tall. Lots of spunk. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you, we would see him. Oh yeah, when right we, there. When we, when we were downtown, he would walk up and down with, with, with the uh, checkbook Check under his arm. And because in case any of us went to jail, he had the checkbook so that he could uh, get us out. And when he would uh, walk up and downtown, and I heard Mr. Harvey say he would be all up in the police face, and and talking to him because he 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 was very, very a, a very strong man. I strong really, will. Mm -hmm, very strong will. And I never shall forget to see him walking up and down Palafox Street while we were sitting in. Because every time we would sit in and see what would happen was they would close the counter down, so we would go to the next counter. And then when we got there, they would close it down. So we'll go to the next one, then we'll start back up. And that's how we would do it. Della, mm -hmm. did you ever have anyone else aside from, from blacks during that time that wanted maybe to participate in the sit-ins with you? No, the students weren't allowed. Uh, in fact, the only time that we played uh, with the white students, if we lived in the same neighborhood, uh, maybe two or three blocks from each other. Mm -hmm. We could play together, but we could not attend schools or do anything else together. So they were not allowed to participate because the white parents refused to. But that didn't stop us. We, we were determined. Persevered. Right. Now mm -hmm. you mentioned the jailings. Do you know if there were maybe 50 or 100 or even more young people that were jailed during that time? Well, usually it was uh, the days that we participated in the city in It was usually about three or four boys at a time. Uh, now, I can't tell you how many times uh, they were arrested because that was so long ago I've right, forgotten okay. some things. <laughs> <laughs> so Reverend mm -hmm. Dobbins, mm -hmm. We know that he was honored, right? Tell us yes. about that, Cheryl. What happened here in Pensacola well, regarding that? Well, it was last, was last year, year before last. Yes. yes. Then mm -hmm. We decided, the group, because we didn't even know each other until we just decided to, to come get, together. Yes. None of us. I didn't even mm -hmm. know Della. All right. Now you're fast friends, aren't yes. you? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't even know Della. So we, uh, the young lady named... Um, Sarah, Sarah Jonas. Jonas decided that she wanted to do a mm -hmm. marker and mm -hmm. she got in contact with me and that's how we got this this started. So we decided to do a marker downtown uh, honoring the sit-ins and, yes. and, and uh, Reverend Dobbins uh, name and we invited his wife and his family in and everything and it turned out very well. And I think a lot of people need to go down there and read that marker because it, it, it's saying something about what the young people did here in Pensacola. And give us the specific location of the marker. It's on uh, Palafox and Garden. Now, as far as raising funds for the marker, was it donated or, or how did this come about financially? It was uh, donations uh, from some of the participants who participated years ago. and. Uh, 
with Reverend Powell, worked with us mm -hmm. very, very diligently, and uh, Dr. Beasley. And of course, we spent some of our own money. We spent quite a bit and of our own And rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful mm -hmm. cause. Now, aside from Reverend Dobbins, were there ministers from other faiths that came together to make this happen? They did. That, uh, Reverend Dobbins went to the ministers and asked them if they would. That's how the uh, mass meeting started and asked them if they, if they could help raise funds in case some of the young people went to jail because the NAACP didn't, I guess, have much money. Right. So they they requested, and this is how we start having mass meetings at the different churches okay. all over Pensacola. Right. So, Della, I'm going to take you back to the first day that you participated in a sit-in. Were your parents aware, and did you feel there was any threat to your family for your participation? They were aware because my father had to give his permission. Uh, having seven girls and two boys, he was very protective of the girls. So Reverend Dobbins uh, got permission from my father for me to, to participate, and I did so. Um, I was one of the ones who was spit on, mm, and uh, I never told my father about it. I told my mother years ago. And I never really got over it. I put it in the back of my mind. And from time to time now, after I've told my kids about it, they didn't even know I had participated. After I told them about it, I started getting emotional about it. And uh, a few years after the sit-ins, I came across the man that spit on me. Did he say anything to you? He didn't remember me. Didn't remember he you. didn't remember me. And uh, he was disabled. At the time that he did it, he called me the N-word, and he just spit. So sad. So uh, he tried to do it to someone else, but I think someone caught him. And after then, I wasn't able to participate in the sit-in. I was sort of the runner to go okay. uh, get the, the, the funds to bail the fellows out of jail. So Cheryl, back to your corner your first day participating, what was going through your mind? Well, I knew that that was something I wanted to be a part of. Uh, it, was a, it was something that I felt that I need to do, even at 14. And I think uh, it was about, when, when I counted, it was about 30 of us who, okay. in, in the whole, in the whole group, mm -hmm, that, uh, that, that uh, sat in. Uh, some of us are deceased, but uh, the majority of us are still still around. And it was something that I'm glad I did. It was an experience. And I think that anything that, that's worth fighting for is worth having. Love mm -hmm. conquers all. Mm -hmm. Now, Della, Reverend Dobbins, when the chips were down and someone spits on you, that's an emotional thing. A lot of people don't get over that. How did he help keep you guys close and courageous? Let's well, just right say. after it happened, there I was sitting between two of the male participants, and I remember our, our hands were on the counter, and uh, they could see I was getting emotional, so they just put their hands on top of mine and kept me quiet. And uh, we continued the sit-in, but at the end of the day, Reverend Dobbins would not let me continue. So to, uh, I wanted to be a part of it, but uh, he didn't want that to happen to me again. Cheryl, when people hear the word hate, what do you want to tell anyone out there that has that spirit, having known what you experienced in the sit-ins? Well, hate, Hate is, is, is a very negative word, and it's not going to do anything but eat the person up. Not going to eat me up because I don't hate. And once you, once you get that hate in your heart, you've got to realize we were all made by God. And God is, God is our protector. And we got to realize that we, we, we must learn to love one another. Last word, Della, on love. Well, I'm full of it. <laughs> I'm from a large family, 
and I brought my kids up the way that we were brought. There was a lot of love in our family, and I carry it on. All right, mm -hmm. ladies, Cheryl and Della learned a lot. Love you both so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank being you with for us. Having you. All right, get ready for another musical treat as you sit back and enjoy this next clip from our Voices Are Many, the Sons of Africa. Sheriff David Morgan delivers a heartfelt rendition of Sam Cooke's A Change Is Gonna Come. Lord, there have been times when I thought I couldn't last for long. Now I know I'm able to carry on. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. WSRE's Public Square Speaker Series presents author and marine scientist Ellen Prigger. Don't miss her fun and compelling talk about the wealth of life in the sea and the need to protect it. February 23rd at 7 in the Amos Studio. Admission is free. what it takes to become a successful high school principal who's earned the respect of his students and colleagues? How about the hard work and determination it takes to become a successful athlete while achieving major milestones both academically and professionally? During this segment, we'll be focusing on the historic Booker T. Washington High School and two dedicated visionaries who work there. First, we have the school's principal, Dr. Michael Roberts, and joining him is the Wildcats head football coach, Charlie Ward. Thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you for having us. All yeah. right, gentlemen, let's get started. Dr. Roberts, Booker T. Washington High School. Now, I know that there was a journey that took place before you actually got there. We want to motivate those who are watching to reach for the stars. So let's talk about your educational journey early on as a child. I would be happy to share that experience. Initially, I graduated from Escambia High School. I'm a native Pensacolian. I started out at Morehouse University, was there for a short period of time, left mm -hmm. there and went to the University of Alabama and finished up from Florida State University. And I uh, came home, worked for a while. I can remember when Booker T. Washington High School was being built when they transferred from the uh, Tahar location to where they are located today. Okay, right, right here today. Yes, and uh, went back to graduate school at Florida State, and here I am in Pensacola, Florida. All right, handsome little youngster there. <laughs> your journey, let me just say this. You earned your PhD, was it at the University of West Florida? From the University of West okay. Florida, that is correct. I initially started the work at Florida State, okay. transferred the credits, and finished up at the University of West Florida. Speaking of Florida State and alums, Charlie Ward, so glad to have you here. Now, I had a chance just to do a little bit of reading, and you have such a, a wonderful life, but there is a guiding force in your life that keeps you going. Why don't you tell us what that is? Uh, well, I think you're referring to my relationship with the Lord. Uh, which is something that um, I work at daily. I'm not perfect, but I'm grateful that I have had parents who uh, guided me in the right direction uh, when it came to having a relationship with the Lord. And they took us to church and did all the necessary things to make sure they planted seeds um, of 
wisdom um, and also what it takes to have a relationship by their example. And we'll talk a little bit about your Heisman Trophy momentarily, but a little flashback here. When you were in high school, there was a significant thing that happened to you. You had a knee injury, a triple threat. Tell us about the three sports that you played in high school and in college and what that knee injury did to you mentally. Uh, well, actually, I ended up playing four sports in high Another school. Another one? Yes. Okay. Um, I played football and basketball. And um, two years, I split running track oh. and baseball. Awesome. And, um, but my freshman and sophomore year, my freshman year, I ended up having a knee injury that derailed my athletic um, time. And uh, what it really did was help me focus on what was more important because just like the injury happened, in a split second, um, it definitely helped me to understand that academics was something that was more important uh, because that's going to last a long, last longer. And my parents, of course, being an athlete, that's all they talked about was academics, uh, making sure you have that in order. And then I was thrown into the mix where I had to focus on that, and so it was a, a challenging time. But uh, God pushed me through it and made, uh, gave me an opportunity to uh, learn from it. And I had a successful career over 11 years in the NBA and five football, basketball seasons in college. Amazing, we'll get back to you in just a moment. A quadruple threat. Dr. Roberts, let's talk about goals, setting them and the importance of having them. Very important to set goals. Goals are your roadmap to success in life. And one should learn to start setting those goals very early in life. Start with small goals, set them to be accomplished every couple of days, and graduate to weeks, months, and years. Goals will make milestones happen. The higher the goals, the greater the success will be. Even if we don't accomplish those goals, we'll land somewhere and have a field of accomplishment. Have you ever had a student come to you and say, I just don't know how I'm going to do this, Dr. Roberts. Help me. Give Often, me an example. as recently <laughs> as today, that is a common occurrence. And uh, I pride myself in that because kids are comfortable enough to come to me seeking that kind of advice. But when they do, I sit them down and talk with them and ask them what it is that they're, they're wanting in life and what it is they're trying to do and work with them through the process of setting goals. That's awesome. Now, Charlie, you mentioned the importance of actually setting goals and writing them down. Do you have a little visionary board or a place where you post goals? Some people use post-it notes or sometimes they'll just keep them internally, but how has goal setting helped you through all your accomplishments? Uh, well, I'm, I don't know if writing them down or post-it notes or those types of things, but um, I do have tablets. tablets. I have a bunch of tablets That's around good. the house um, <laughs> that I write things in and I go back and check, check them to make sure that I'm meeting those, uh, those goals or expectations that I've set for whether it's myself, family, or the program or whatever it may be, and, um, and working towards making sure that those goals are being met. Now, your time at FSU, I read that you really admired Coach Bowden and that he would allow you to play more than one sport. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, well, going into college, um, Coach Bowden, when he was recruiting me, um, told me that I could play uh, football and basketball. And that was one of the main reasons why I chose Florida State um, was because Coach Bowden had the history behind him uh, allowing guys to play basketball and football. And uh, once, and he was also a, a man of God, which uh, helped out tremendously as well. And I trusted that he was telling me the right thing. Absolutely. And so once I got there, uh, he allowed me to, to make it happen. So tell our viewers which year you earned the Heisman Trophy. Uh, I was blessed to be able to win the Heisman Trophy in 1993, um, my senior year, uh, which we had a very good year. We lost one game that year. Uh, but I was surrounded by some very good football players and, and coaches as well. So I was just, just carrying the torch for, carrying those, the torch. for those guys. Then on to the national championship. Right. We ended up winning the national championship that year, which capped it off. Now, when you graduated, you had a lot of options on the table. You could have 
gone into baseball major leagues with the Yankees, I believe, and there was that basketball that was on the line there, and then we know that the NFL, that did not happen, but then tell us how you were able just to say, okay, let's just focus on what the path is for my life. What was your perspective after all that? Uh, well, after my last football game, I continued to play basketball because I was a senior point guard on the basketball team. So I chose to continue to play basketball, which kept my options open uh, for playing professional basketball or football. And so once I made that decision, um, I had to continue to pursue both, and I did. Unfortunately, the NFL made a decision that my commitment wasn't good enough. Okay. Uh, so um, I continued right. to pursue uh, the NBA career. Um, well, I, I also got my degree as well. So I had a few options, and I, that's the way I wanted it to be. And God honored my heart and uh, allowed me to have an opportunity to play in the NBA. Amen. So Nick Spurs and the Rockets. We're going to come back to you in just a moment, Coach. All right, Dr. Roberts, let's talk about the School Advisory Council at Booker T. We have a very active School Advisory Council consisting of 25 to 30 parents. Um, they're very vocal. They show up for the meetings. We have our meetings midday. It's a lunching meeting. Uh, we have an um, awesome, awesome parent who is the chairperson of the School Advisory Council. And they help us guide and make decisions that uh, direct not only the curriculum, but the total operations of the school. It is a piece by which the parents have a voice in our school. That's awesome. So a lot of people are wondering, Coach Ford, how did you wind up at Booker T? I know there's that FSU connection there, alum, but what drove you here to the Pensacola area from Houston? Uh, well, one is the FSU alum uh, connection, which is Derek Brooks, uh, who brought the idea to me of being here at Booker T. Washington, where he's an alumni. And, um, and we were looking to move back closer to our family. My wife's from Wonderful. Atlanta, and I'm from Thomasville, Georgia. And of course, Florida State is in Tallahassee, which is a little closer than where we <laughs> are currently. Um, so it, gives, it gave me an opportunity to get back closer. Uh, but more importantly, when I got a chance to meet the kids that was, were here, yes, um, it, it, it opened my eyes that this could be a place where we could be successful. And not just winning football games, but also helping guys develop um, spiritually and helping them understand what life is all about. That's amazing. The two of you working together at Booker T. Washington High School, I think, is phenomenal. Thank you. Dr. Roberts, I know that a lot of times the motto, for example, your motto at Booker T, everyone is included. There's no big I or little you. That could cause problems, right? It could. You're correct. But we're, we're all a family. All kids of you the same, all faculty and everyone. It's a great, diverse school where everyone is receptive and, and welcomes everyone. It's great to be a Wildcat. All right, for both of you, thank you so much, Coach and Dr. Roberts. Such thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. Okay, in this next clip from our Voices Are Many, the Sons of Africa, Elder Ricky Duffy delivers a powerful excerpt from one of Martin Luther King's most famous speeches, I Have a Dream. Enjoy it as we head to break. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, yeah. from every state and every city, yeah. we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, yeah. black men and white men, yeah. Jews and Gentiles, yeah. Protestants and Catholics, yeah. will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. Join WSRE at Gulfaria Marine Adventure Park for PBS Kids and Family Day, Saturday, March 11th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Meet your favorite PBS Kids characters. Enjoy crafts, a scavenger hunt, a bounce house, and discover all the fun that Gulfarium offers. See the dolphin and sea lion shows and explore the animal exhibits and aquariums. Bring your cameras, bring your kids. Don't miss it. Saturday, March 11th at Gulfaria Marine Adventure Park in Fort Walton Beach on Okaloosa Island.
During this segment, we're continuing our journey with Booker T. Washington High School as we explore several of its educational milestones. I'm happy to introduce Carla Ross, an instructor with the Marketing and Entrepreneurship Academy. Joining her, we have Natalie Imperial, who is president of DECA, an international association of marketing students. DeAndre Treacle is DECA's vice president. So happy to have all of you here with us Thank this you. evening. You're looking great. All right, Carla, let's start with you. MEA. I did a little bit of reading, and I'm just going to tell you, so proud of you. I know Dr. Roberts is, Coach Ward is also. Give us an overview, first of all, of MEA. Well, it's the Marketing Entrepreneurship Academy. We started in 1982 when the school opened, and we transitioned into the academy in 2008. And it's the school store. And we provide a service for our students, our faculty, and staff. So the Cat Shack, as they call it, is that right, DeAndre? Is it the Cat Shack? Yes, ma'am. As DECA Vice President, you probably have worked a few days in the Cat Shack. Talk about it. Not just a few, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Cat Shack is a wonderful experience that trains us on real world um, benefactors that we might need, well, we will need in life. Yes, you will. And so it, it trains all her students on everything that you'll need in the business aspect. But as I understand, this is a, a real world experience. You give them that opportunity to experience what would happen in their lives elsewhere, which I think is remarkable. So a day in the life of DeAndre mm -hmm. at the Cat Shack, what would that entail? Um, I am the general manager, one of the general managers for the Cat Shack. So I basically oversee everything on how it's operating. And we have positions. Everyone has their position that they must fill during, throughout the day. And I just ensure that everyone's doing their duties to the best performance. Now, Natalie, I heard that at the Cat Shack, DECA president, that you make deliveries to faculty and staff every day is that right if they want some coffee from the cat shack they can get coffee yes, or anything else they request yes ma'am well we have three sections technically four um, of the cat shack i personally work in cold side which is where the students come through and so we take their deliveries or their orders excuse me and they go through hot side um, but back of the house is where those students deliver to the teachers so um, soon Part of our project is to change up positions, so I will be working in back of the house serving teachers and faculty and staff. All right, let's talk about the hot side. Do you work collaboratively, DeAndre, with the culinary department? Oh, yes, ma'am. Talk about that. Culinary is a, a, bi a big, <laughs> major help to um, the Cat Shack. They prepare our grilled cheese, um, our seasonal soups. So we have taco soup, our chicken, um, chicken noodle soup, and our chicken salad sandwich, which is our new product that we are selling throughout the Cat Shack, and it's a major boom. You're making me hungry, DeAndre. <laughs> Carla, back to you. Let's talk dollars and cents. So there's money being exchanged here, right? Oh, yes. So Wait. somebody has to keep track of that, right? <laughs> oh, yes. Let's talk about that. Well, my second year students, the class is to marketing applications. The class is divided into an accounting department, purchasing, human resources, sales, and advertising. So the accounting section balances out the register daily and um, you know make sure that the credit debit is uh, in line and they take the money daily to the bookkeeper to keep us, to keep us legal. Mm -hmm. Are there any certifications that students can achieve through MEA? Any certifications that will help them after they graduate? Serve safe certification, which is a national certification, and they'd be able to get a job in any restaurant in the country. A lot of students That's like wonderful. to pursue that. And then we also have a, a secondary um, certification that's coming online right now, which is going to be uh, customer service, which we're excited awesome. about. Natalie, let's talk about the credit union. What is your hand in that? Well, I'm a student teller at our Wildcat Credit Union, and basically we do exactly what a normal teller would do, except we're a student. Um, so we make transactions. A lot of kids just come in there to get change, and then we encourage them to um, then set up an account with Penair. So we're also promoting Penair as well as um, just working with our students and customer service, and Dr. Roberts comes in there. We All do right, transactions, <laughs> and yeah. 
Basically all That's the stuff good. a normal teller would do. Now I read, Carla, that some of these students can have internships and maybe possibly after graduation earn a position at Panera Federal Credit oh, Union. Absolutely. Talk about that. I think that's real good. Well, one of our former students uh, is actually working in member services at NAS, uh, the NAS branch of Panera Federal Credit Union. And uh, the opportunities are endless for them because there's so many, you know, different financial institutions in the city and in the country. So with that internship, would the teller come to the campus and work in your Wildcat Credit Union alongside the student, I guess, to show the student how things are done? Is that how the internship works, or would the student actually go to the, the credit union? Students actually go they to go the credit there. union, yes, and they may have summer positions, paid positions with the credit mm -hmm. union, and it's pretty exciting, and DeAndre is, uh, is a teller as well. All right, DeAndre, let's talk about <laughs> volunteerism. Love that smile, that oh, million dollar you. smile. Thank you. So, I know DECA does a lot, so talk about some of the things you do outside the walls of Booker T. Washington. Outside of walls? Let's see. Um, I am in quite of a outside bit of um, activities that I do. A lot of them are um, after school activities. It's I, right now, I'm currently volunteering with uh, West Florida. I, I want to say the medical program they have going on. Okay, I volunteer at the, the elder home. It's called ACE. They have it there at um, West Florida. I, I'm not necessarily a student at West Florida because I am at Booker T. But that's okay. But, yeah, I still go and volunteer <laughs> with my sister because my sister is a student at West Florida. Carla, getting back to you, it is so important for students to be well-rounded like both of you are. Thank you. Volunteerism is so important, We're talking about scholarships and other things, and it makes yeah. us better people, right? Yes. Volunteerism. Yes. So talk about maybe some of the other organizations that you may partner with. One Blood Services. Okay. And we have um, a big blood drive coming up February 16th, which they're all involved in. It's part of what they do and they get community service hours for that but it's four times a year and they actually write projects for it uh, Mana Food Bank oh my gosh we love working with Mana yes. and that's been an ongoing partnership uh, American Heart Association Cancer Society it, it runs the gamut whoever needs us we're available. I know that's right. Now our theme is love conquers all. Love is in the air, love is in your heart, Natalie. And I understand that you prepared a little snippet of a song that you're going to sing for us a cappella that really emphasizes Dr. King's dream of love conquers all. So tell us what it is and I'll let you take the floor. Okay. Um, well, I was inspired by John 17. Um, Jesus' last words were, let them be one as we are one. And so this song is called Make Us One by Phil Driscoll. And I'll just sing the chords. All right, have at it. Make us one heart. Make us one mind. Make us one. Let your will be done. Make us one heart to proclaim your name. Make us one, Lord, make us one. So angelic. That was exceptional, Natalie. Thank you. You're so humble. Thank you for blessing all of us with that. Now, Thank Carla, you, you have you. some very talented students in your midst, and I love their humility. You give back, DeAndre, back to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, you know I like talking to you, right? Hi, thank you. Now, are you a senior? What grade are you in? No, ma'am, I'm a junior. You're a junior. So, during your last year in MEA, and of course as DECA Vice President, will there be another class that brings you one step closer, as they would say, to completion in Mrs. Ross's plan for you? I am actually in the advanced class. I work in the cat shack and the credit union and I don't think it goes a step higher this is the advanced this is the pinnacle yes so, so I'll just have another year and I'll guide the upcoming students that's good so Natalie what grade are you in 
I'm a senior. I'm You're a senior. Yes, so what are your plans after graduation? Well, I'm currently going to do a competition in New York City um, in a few weeks. I want to go to the King's College in Manhattan and pursue international marketing and sales. All right. Now, when we speak of motivation, Carla, and I know that you're a motivator. I could just mm. tell that from the first moment we <laughs> <Yes>. spoke. <laughs> How do you motivate students like DeAndre and Natalie and everyone in the program to reach for the stars, to go one better? I have a gift, and my yes. gift is to see who they are down the line. I see them 10 years later. I don't see them where they are. So they're just the seed of themselves, and uh, like diamonds in the rough. I like that. And you have to chip and knock and smooth them out a little bit. It, take, it takes at least a couple of years, but oh my gosh, the miracle of watching them bloom and grow. Uh, I tell them my goal is that they tell me what to do. All right. So, uh, and once they get there, and they're doing a great job. So they know what they're doing, right? <laughs> they, they're doing a yes. great job. They'll say, Miss Ross, DeAndre, you'll say, Miss Ross, I know what I'm doing. I hope I have a good grade. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> so DeAndre, any advice that you would give to young people, maybe your age out there, that are maybe struggling a little bit, and they're not achieving their goals as they wish they would, to help push them forward, what would you tell them? Um, one thing that personally I need to work on and that I see others could possibly need as well is using your voice. Miss Ross has really pushed it to where I use my voice because I would sit back and just let things happen and not voice my opinion. So I just to tell the young students or kids coming up that they need to use their voice. All right, well said, all of you. Thank you for being with us. Now, again, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us this evening, including all of you for watching. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Have a good evening, and remember to keep it locked in right here on WSRE, PBS for the Gulf Coast.